Hello everyone, welcome to this wonderful, wonderful masterclass. I am Natalie Di Marci and Michael Wozniak. And tonight we are hosting Kathleen Laval. Kathleen Laval is the program director of uh, NLP Seminar Group International and uh, they are hosting, they are preparing all the seminars um, with the, Dr. Richard Bandler, John Laval, and of course, Kathleen Laval, who is the jewel of uh, NLP. She is master trainer of NLP and DHE, and her passion is the meta model. So this masterclass is going to go deeper and deeper into the meta model. Hi, Kathleen. Thank Hi. you for being with us. Hi, Natalie. <laughs> Thank you for sponsoring me today <laughs> to be here. So just to introduce the, the evening, so we'll start with a brief introduction on the meta model that Kathleen will make. We'll go very fast on that part because we presuppose that you already know things about the meta model. Then we're going to go through the questions that have been asked. We had very good questions that from all over the world. Uh, we had people registering from 32 countries uh with yeah. questions from all over the all over the planet even one one place that i didn't know of so interesting um and after that we're going to go more advanced there will be more advanced things about the meta model so just stay tuned um remember to um to register or to uh to um, click the little bell yes to click so the little bell and <laughs> you 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 get all the information yes, from us exactly so kathleen we are really pleased to have you with us so what is the meta model kathleen <laughs> Well, as you know, I'm very passionate about the subject and uh, the real magic, you know, whether you talk to Richard, or John or myself, I will tell you that the, the real magic of NLP is the language. I mean, that's the distinction that makes the difference. There are fabulous coaching courses out there. And when they look at some of the things that we do within the language, it's like, wow, you know, that really is like the icing on the cake. It adds that special magic to what you do. Um, so we have some great models that help you to really, really understand where your client's coming from, what level of processing that's going on in their brain so that you can understand better, you know, what's going to be the perfect match for them in whatever you're going to help them do, or just to understand and help them to understand how they got wrapped up in that loop or how they got stuck in that block so that you can help them to find the path out of it. And it's something that's hard to do for yourself. You know, you can kind of listen to your own words, listen to your own language, you know, um, write it out or something. But it, it's different when you have somebody asking great questions to help and guide you to what it is that you want to know. So the real magic is in this process of asking great questions. Now, I have a little soapbox uh, speech I'm going to give about the meta model because I've seen it taught in, in ways that really upset me. And I was taught that way originally, um, that you used words like meta model violations and you uh, challenged the meta model violation. And I think that the whole process is a dance to me. The whole process of listening to someone say something, asking a great question, getting that information, asking another question and shifting gears and moving directions. Those are, those are dances. It's not a violation. Ooh, you did a simple deletion. Ooh, you know, and I'm going to challenge you. And, um, you know, it becomes the interrogation model. So for me, it, it, it has to be a process of true exchange. And that's how you get that. And some of the questions, you know, were in that area. And I'll go back to those when we get to those questions. But what I'd like to do is um, I'm going to share my screen just for a moment here. Um, okay. Perfect. Okay. Oh, well, no. What happened? <laughs> mm. 
Okay, maybe not. Okay, so um, in the process of speaking, in the process of remembering, in the process of the experiences of now, this is what happens in any interaction. You have an experience, you go to a concert, you walk outside, you smell the fresh air, you know, whatever it is, you're in the moment now. And every moment of now, you're taking in information, you're taking all the information in, you have it through your five senses, all the other filters are engaged. In fact, the filters that are there are, you know, your visuals, your auditories, your kinesthetic, your olfactory, gustatory, your beliefs, your values, your sorting patterns, and then you also delete, distort, and generalize information. When all that filtering is taking place, that information is coming in, and we put it into what we call our deep structure, which is our memory. Now, someone comes along and says, hey, how was that concert? Or how was the weather today? And you have to go back into that deep structure and pull out that information, that memory. And when you do that, you're passing it through a second set of filters. So by the time you actually speak the answer to that question, the actual experience has been filtered at least twice. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not a bad thing. It's just the way it works. It's the way your brain works. It's the way we work as human beings. So when we filter that information twice and we say something, you know, how was that concert? Hey, it was pretty good. You know, how was that concert? Oh, the music was great, but you know, the lasers were really annoying. They were too fast. They didn't go with the music. You know, whatever you're saying. Now, the point is that this information has been filtered twice from the actual experience. So unless I'm a person that will give you tons of details and go on and on for hours and maybe even elaborate and add some things that weren't there, you're not going to experience the concert the way I experienced the concert just by me even describing it. So it's filtered out. Now, not a big deal. We're talking about how was the concert? It was great. When a client comes to you and you say, what do you want? How can I help you? What is it you'd like me to do for you today? When they answer that question and they tell you what they want, it's also filtered twice. So in order to get closer and closer to the actual experience, then we need to use a system. Now, remember, one of the filters is this deletion, distortion, and generalization. So we delete information, we distort information, and we generalize. Again, not a bad thing, because what's really important is that if we didn't delete, distort, and generalize information, we'd be in a hell of a lot of trouble. Imagine if you had no ability to delete information. So every moment in time, you'd have to be paying attention to everything around you every sight, every smell, every feeling, every sound, every experience in your body, you know, it, it would be maddening if we couldn't delete information. Distortion is one of my favorites because it is the pattern of creativity. Imagine if you couldn't distort information, you would have to see everything exactly as it is. And there would be no room for negotiation, for creativity, for anything, because the distortion is what allows people to look at um, one of those corn huskers, the old corn huskers they used on the farm to take the husk off the corn. Well, somebody with great distortion ability can look at that and go, oh, I can make a lamp <laughs> and sell it for $500. <laughs> you know, and so, I mean, people can look at things, those big uh, wooden things they wrap the cable around when they're doing con construction, you know, and they go, can I go, oh, that would make a great table. I can make a poker table out of that, <laughs> you know. So it's that distortion that you can look at something and imagine it to be something else. Distortion is also great for problem solving because if you can look at a problem and distort it to where it actually can be a solution to something else or an ability to gain information about something else, then that's great. So distortions are very useful. Generalizations is how we learn. We're patterners. That's part of our, our historic ability to survive is that we recognize patterns. We can pick up on patterns very easily. So it's a very important learning process is to be able to generalize and pattern. So, so these things are all good. So for, for me to see somebody treat the meta model and the filtering system 
as a violation and we have to challenge it. You know, you're, you're punishing somebody for doing what the human brain has done and, uh, and allowed us to evolve to this point. So that's my soapbox speech for the day that, you know, we have to look at this as a discovery. So I'm going to suggest that everybody right now pick your favorite treasure hunter, whether it be Indiana Jones or, you know, whoever you want and, and put that Indiana Jones hat on, you know, or, or whoever you pick, you know, your adventurer. I want you to look at the meta model or look at your client in that way, because the words they speak are going to be filled with little hidden gems or little hidden codes that you can decipher to help them find the treasure that they really want. So that's about the attitude of when you're working with someone with the meta model is, is listening to the words and knowing that there's more information in there, that there's hidden gems, there's information that's going to help you get exactly your client to where they want to be. I'm sure any of you who've done coaching or NLP or anything like that, you know, you've had somebody, they told you what they wanted, you bought it, you went for it, and you found out that it really wasn't what they wanted. <laughs> yeah. And then you're like, mm -hmm. because sometimes it's just easy with our generalization and patterning, you know, we'll just adopt it and go, oh yeah, I know, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> as, as a coach, as an NLP programmer, as an NLP trainer, that phrase should go away. I know exactly what you mean. Oh, I understand. No, you don't. So put the adventurer hat and go for the go for the treasure hunt. That's the attitude that I would like everyone to take with me today as we go through some of this stuff. So in understanding this process of building, you know, the experience that we have and that we want, you know, the way that we store things and the way that we communicate we just get that one point that that surface structure has already been filtered twice so we have to kind of pull back and and search and hunt for the hidden gems so that we get the client to have exactly the experience that they want to have and the beauty of that is if you do this process well enough i tell my practitioners all the time when i'm teaching if you do this process well enough if you do the desired state well enough a lot of times you're done. Once the client understands because they've gone through their own filters back to the exact experience that they want. And when they try it on and they experience how good it does feel and how wonderful they can see things through that new filter and hear things and, and do things. And a lot of times you're done. You know, the motivation is there. Everything is there. Um, sometimes you don't even have to do anything else other than just take them through this process to get a really good, well-formed goal or, or desired state. So uh, let me uh, stop sharing just for a moment. And um, I guess we can go on to some of the questions and then we'll move into the yes. time, <laughs> into the model. <laughs> sure. So. Okay. So, so the first question is from Veronique from France. And she was asking, what are the other uses of the meta model apart from the work on beliefs? <laughs> OK, um, well, Ronnie, thank you for the question. Um, one of the, the the uses of the meta model is, is not just about beliefs. And certainly that's one of the important parts that we'll get to in the new model. Um, but it's just because it's around everything that we communicate with. So it's not just a belief. You know, somebody can say, I want a sandwich. Well, you can go make them a turkey sandwich and that's not what they wanted. It has nothing to do with a belief. So this is in, you know, our everyday communication is to take the moment to be sure that we, you know, understand exactly what someone wants when they're asking for it, whether it's in a workplace or a sales environment, if you're selling somebody something, um, you know, and they say, I want this, I want that. It's good to have good questions. Now it's not, we don't want to become the meta monster either. You know, somebody says, I want a turkey sandwich. You know, you don't have to say, well, you know, what kind of turkey do you want? Do you want smoked turkey? Do you, you know, especially if you don't have smoked turkey, don't ask them if they want smoked turkey. But, you know, you don't have to get crazy with it. But, you know, there's an, an average person does not communicate with a lot of detail when they say things because we're used to just 
talking to people that know what we want. We're used to being in situations where people know what they want. So when you go to a situation where people don't, you're still speaking as if you know what I want, you understand what I want. So the meta model is not just about beliefs. Um, it's about any interactive communication that needs more clarity so that you get what the person is talking about and you're able to then satisfy them with whatever it is, whether you're selling them something, teaching them something, or just simply having an interaction like, can I make you a sandwich? <laughs> okay. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> it's, I, I, I love your answers. They are so, so, so precise and clear. We, we have Rich from Island of Man, who is asking how best to use the meta model in everyday life. What would be your highlights? Well, Rich, <laughs> let me say, um, I, you know, I don't use the meta model in everyday life on purpose. I mean, it's, it's, you know, once you work with it and you know the model, it kind of gets automatic in your brain. Um, so I know if I'm talking to someone, I need to be a little more specific with what I'm asking for. Um, you know, that I, I might say to myself, something's not right here. I'm not motivating myself. Um, I don't feel motivated about this. So let me go back and, and look at what I'm planning in my head. So, you know, you have evidence-based information that comes in that says something's not right you need to pay attention and the most part i don't consider the use that of use of the meta model it's just about having communication if i'm speaking with someone and all of a sudden i'm like whoa wait a minute we're, we're talking like this then my meta model alarm goes off and i'm going to start engaging and asking quite better questions but otherwise i i really don't um don't use it now if you're talking about you know, use of the meta model every day in terms of practicing, that's a little different and that's a little easier. And I think we have some other questions that line up with that as well. Um, there's lots of ways to practice it and we'll go over some of those. Okay, thank you. And I think, uh, yeah, the next one is, uh, is also uh, quite similar. It's uh, yeah. from Carolyn from New Zealand. And she's asking, how can you find the balance of maintaining rapport with the client while asking him challenging questions in the meta model? Yeah, this, Carolyn, this is exactly what we were talking about. Um, if you're losing rapport, then you're probably in the interrogation mode uh, with your client and not with the adventure mode, because I have never had a problem asking great questions if I do it from a state that to me combines two things. One is I truly care about helping the person. So I sort of spin that feeling in myself that I, I care and I want to help this person. And the other piece is this strong urgency of curiosity. And it's I spin this curiosity and this caring. And that's where I'm coming from when I ask the questions. And uh, I joke around in the seminars, um, I give people a model to, to go uh, model, and that's uh, Columbo. And if you don't know who Columbo is, go look him up on the internet because he was an old TV show. He was an old detective. He had a rumpled coat. He was always big cigars, you know, and, and he was the, ar, 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 you know, he always sounded like he was confused. Now, I don't say to go to that extreme, but he nobody took him seriously. The bad guys always just never took him seriously and overlooked him because they thought he didn't know what he was doing because he was kind of a bumbling, uh, confused old guy. And, and he would always, of course, get the, the person to confess um, or get them caught in a lie. And that's because he came from this, this sense, he was always like, mm, you know, thinking and curious, mm, you know, you told me, mm, you know, kind of thing. So if you go from that sense of curiosity you know, with caring, I've never had a, a person go like, why are you asking me all these questions? You know, and if somebody did that, then I would say, because I really want to make sure I get exactly what it is you want. So you get what you want and not, you know, mixing in my own stuff. So I, mean, I have no problem saying that to a client, but I've, I've never had anyone uh, balk at the way I'm do at the way I'm doing it. So I think if you're, if you're concerned about maintaining rapport while asking questions, because even that word is in the question, challenging questions. Hmm. You gotta get rid of that headset. This is not a challenge. This is a treasure hunt. And you're helping them find their treasure. 
you're assisting them. So when you ask the questions and we go over the, the advanced model later, we'll go over actually asking some questions. So, you know, that'll be something that uh, you'll see the technique in that. But it's really about spinning a great feeling of, you know, you care about the person. And if you don't, then you're in the wrong profession. <laughs> but, you know, if you care about the person and you're really curious, then, you know, you just ask the questions, looking for those hidden gems and get rid of that violation challenge model out of your head. And that report question is going to go away. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Judith from Germany is asking, well, she's saying, dear Kathleen, thank you for this wonderful masterclass. And uh, she's asking, maybe you have another tip on how you can motivate people who like to generalize more quickly to give specific answers. Now, here's where I'm going to go backtracking a little bit with mm. the report, because if someone is not willing to give you specific information, then they don't trust you. And that's a hallucination on my part. I'm going to admit that right now. That's a generalization and a hallucination because I don't know who we're actually talking about. But um, I can kind of guess that if someone's not willing to give specific information to you, then they probably don't trust you. They, you probably haven't built that uh, sense of rapport with them, or you haven't made them um, made it clear to them what your purpose is, that your purpose is to help them, that your purpose is to help them find, you know, that that hidden treasure, that hidden gem that they want to have. So so that's, you know, that's my my answer to that question. Um, there is no other tip other than, you know, if you do the questions right, and you have that sense of the rapport with them, then and that doesn't mean you have to sit there for 30 minutes and body match and breathing and all that stuff. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about some basic principles and understanding the process that we're going to do today. And here's what we're going to do. I tell people up front, I say, look, here's what we're going to do. You're going to tell me what you want. I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. And sometimes you might think to yourself, hey, why are you asking all these questions? But bear with me. Trust me, it's going to be great because we're both on a treasure hunt here. And we're going to, so there's nothing wrong with doing all that. You know, you just tell them up front. I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. It's going to seem crazy, but trust me, it's all part of the process. Um, you know, and then we're going to do this. And then, you know, I might do that. And, and you're going to feel great. You know, uh, so, so that would be my suggestion. I think we skipped one about being fluid in the use of the meta model. Um, Marie? Uh, ah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. exactly. I just wanted to tie in that same thing with the, exactly. the question above it. Um, being fluid in it means that you've actually practiced it. And one of the best ways to practice the meta model is to generate the patterns. Mm. You know, take your, if you have your manual or whoever, whatever list of meta model patterns you have and generate them. When I mean generate, I mean put a pencil in your hand and a piece of paper or pen or marker crayon, I don't care, <laughs> and generate the patterns. If you want to do it on your keyboard, you can. Um, but the, the more movement, the better in terms of the brain. Um, but I'll take fingers on a keyboard if that's what you have to do. Um, mm -hmm. But generate those patterns. You know, sit there and, and say, you know, all right, I'm going to do five simple deletions, five comparative deletions, five unspecified verbs, write sentences for each one, you know, and the more you do that, the more you generate it, the more you'll use it speaking, and the more you'll hear it when other people are speaking. And that's the key way to be fluid in the meta model is to write out the patterns. And this is something you can do, you know, you're stuck in a waiting room somewhere, you know, you're on a bus or a train or a plane, um, not while you're driving. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, there's all times when we get stuck somewhere. And I tell you, I would rather you take out your own pad and pencil and write out patterns than to pick up a, a magazine in a waiting room that everyone else has touched. So just a clue. <laughs> <laughs> write out your patterns. Anytime you're stuck like that, just start generating two or three or four, whatever you have time for. But that's the key to be fluent. Okay. Yes, and this question is very connected to uh, from Mar from Mary from France. is very connected to the one from Mark, yes. who was saying how how do you recommend studying the meta model and optimizing our skills with it? So it's really the 
Same yeah. question mark, same, same yeah. thing. Yeah. Write them out. It's magic. It's yeah. absolute magic. Write them out. That's how I did it. You mm -hmm. know, in fact, when we were in our practitioner, we were required at night to do at least 10 of each. And we had to bring them the next morning and show them, I'm sure. <laughs> but I mean, write them out. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so the next question is from Tatiana from Russia. And she's asking, do you think that paraverbal and nonverbal communication are connected to the meta model? Tatiana, I love this question. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, they become more difficult in terms of picking the question. But when someone is paraverbaling, I'm sorry, I apologize again. I, the people watching don't know this yet, but I explained to Michelle and Natalie, I am, I am contractors all over the house because we're moving. And uh, so I'm hidden in this one little room <laughs> to do this call today, <laughs> but I, I can't shut the phone off. So if it rings, I'm just picking it up and putting it down. <laughs> it's a good <laughs> anchor. <laughs> 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 so if someone is paraverbaling or nonverbaling, um, they are doing something in their head. So if you say, how was that concert? And somebody goes, yeah, yeah, that's a paraverbal. You know, if they're, just, if you go, how was that concert? And they go, that's nonverbal, but there's still a communication there. So I would take that as a giant deletion, you know, but it's not a real category, giant deletion but I'm making it a new category. It's called giant deletion. So you would ask, you know, a different question. So, you know, you can, you can suggest, look for counter examples. So if somebody goes, you know, how was that concert? And, and, and they go, hmm. he goes, then you can say, did you like it or did you not like it? You know, was it good? Was it bad? You know, never just assume and go, oh, so it was bad. That's not a question. That's a statement and a guess. And it's like fishing. I always tell people when they're working with a client, fishing is the worst thing you can do because every time you're wrong, you lose a little bit of that rapport. You lose a little bit of that, you know, so it was bad. Well, no, I didn't say it was bad. Oh, so you didn't like it. Well, no, I didn't say that. I mean, uh, so it didn't live up to your expectations. <laughs> no, what are you talking about? So fishing is no good. But you can simply, if it's that important, so you say uh, in a client situation, what do you want? And they say, you know, and you can, well, that's a giant deletion. You have, then at that point, you can ask another question or make a statement that says, in order for me to help you get exactly what it is that you want, I'm going to need some information. <laughs> so you could give me a little hint, <laughs> what is it that you want? Or you can say, I see this is important to you, you know, and, you know, where you wouldn't be here, you know, in front of me as a client. So how can I help you? Ask the question a different way. You say, what do you want? And that didn't work. Then say, how can I help you? You know, change the question in a different way. Because um, sometimes people say, what do you need? Well, if there's isn't something that they need, maybe it was something they wanted. And that's two different things. So if you say, what do you need? And they're like, you know, is there something you want while you're here? You know, then we go, oh, well, yeah, you know, actually. So it would just be about, you know, asking questions. And if, it, if the question doesn't work, then make a statement, you know, in order to be able to help you, I'm going to need some more information. So, you know, what can I do for you? How can I help? Or, you know, change it a couple of different ways and see if you get better responses. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. And just before Natalie um, gives the next question, I just want to let you know uh, to all of you who are listening now that we are watching the various comments we're doing on YouTube. So if you have any questions, any uh, more questions about what Kathleen is saying, just don't hesitate to write it down. And if we have time, we're going to, to go through those questions too. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, the next question I absolutely adore. It's Rosana Huerta from Mexico. She says, I heard that you have a wonderful metaphor about <laughs> a little verb connected to nominalization. Could you tell us that metaphor? 
bedtime story already. <laughs> <The time. laughs> I, it's funny how these things get around, you know. <laughs> well, Rosanna, um, this is uh, the metaphor I tell for nominalizations. And uh, basically, it's about uh, once upon a time, because all great stories start like that. Once upon a time, there was a little verb. And this little verb loved to run and play and skip and jump and do all kinds of fun things in the forest. And this little verb is hopping its way through the forest, very happy. And all of a sudden, this evil witch came and cast a spell on the little verb and turned it into a rock. So now this poor verb is sitting there in the middle of the forest and it could no longer run or play or jump or do any of the fun things. It just had to sit there. It's very sad. But <laughs> our hero, the neuro-linguistic programster, <laughs> came in to the forest and saw the rock and took pity on him. And he broke the spell that the evil witch casted and turned the stone back into a verb so that once again, the little verb could hop and skip and run and jump and play and have all kinds of fun once again. The end, they lived happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love it. <laughs> so basically that, what that means is that, you know, that's what we do with nominalizations. We take a great verb that's great to do things and we turn it into a noun and then we throw it around like, you know, we need more communication. You know, why don't we have more communication here in this company? And, you know, we treat it as a noun. And our job as your NLP uh, programsters is to turn those things back into a verb so we can help our clients get back into the activity and the process that's supposed to be there. So that's what that <laughs> metaphor is about. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. So Radu from Romania is asking, how can we use and teach the meta model to children? Well, here's the funny thing about this. With children, it's best to get rid of the meta model patterns when speaking to them, <laughs> for the most part, uh, especially the modal operators, because um, it, it's complicated to them. Their brains, and when we go into the advanced model, you'll see how, why this is, but their brains are not at that level yet. And it depends on the, the age of the children we're talking about. If you're talking about teaching it to teenagers, absolutely. And you know, people that are in the higher grades, maybe from sixth grade up and definitely high school and you know, getting ready for college, yes. But young, young children, you know, that are like maybe under 10 or under nine, um, there's really no need to get that crazy with it because they're processing the same way. They're building their strategies. They're building their beliefs. They haven't quite yet formed all of that. And, um, and it's better to take it out of the communication. Um, the Milton model works much better with children than the meta model. <laughs> Natalie's shaking her head from experience. Absolutely. <laughs> <Yeah>. I confirm. <laughs> from experience, it's, the Milton model is the way to go. That's when you say, would you like to take your bath before dinner or after dinner? That's the only choice there. You're taking the bath, but do you want it before or after? You know, so those are the fun things in, in the Milton model that you can use with children. Um, but when you say to children, you know, I want you to put your jacket on, you know, it's like, well, that, that's nice. You want me, I don't want to put my jacket on. You want it on me. You know, I need you to put your jacket on. Well, that's nice to need things, you know. I mean, you can get into loops and loops with the patterns. So using the meta model, the only part that I think is really important for children is the cause and effects. Uh, when you're building beliefs that if you do this, then it makes this easier. You know, so if you if you put your toys away when you're done, it makes it easier than uh, spending your whole weekend cleaning your room because, you know, doing this makes this easier. So when you're working with beliefs, I think that some of the meta model patterns are important um, to, to use. Uh, but the, you know, for all the, the modal operators and some of the other stuff, it's like, you know, it's, it's not an issue uh, with younger children. The be most direct communication is best. And that doesn't mean that you bark and go clean your room, put your toys away. I'm not talking about that kind of direct communication, but I'm talking about taking away all the process words 
and still speaking with, you know, uh, the calmness or the love or the curiosity or whatever states you want to use. Um, I'm still talking about using that, not to become a dictator, but you can still get rid of all those process, you know, fancy phrases and words and, and be more direct. Now, teaching children the meta model is the same way you teach an adult. I don't think there's any difference. The, well, the only difference you're gonna find is they'll learn faster because children, <laughs> children have less filters. Let's, talk, let's be honest. You know, I love teaching NLP to children and I love working with children, you know, because if I tell a child to take the picture in their mind and make it bigger and put a purple light on it, they're like, okay. If I tell an adult to do that, they're gonna be going, how much bigger? Wait, why does that have to be purple? Can it be blue? Can, uh, I, what do you mean like a purple light? Like actually see the bulb in the picture or just like a, you know, that, that's what adults do. Children, you know, if I said, take the picture and squish it like a, a, a towel and wring out all the bad feelings, children are like, oh yeah, cool. Yeah, <laughs> and they're doing it. And adults like, what? <laughs> you want me to take my image in my head and squish it like a towel? How's that gonna work? You know, so working with children is not an issue. It should be easy. And if you really want to teach them the meta model patterns, you teach it to them the same way you teach their ABCs or their, you know, um, mathematician the multiplication tables or whatever you're teaching them. Um, I wouldn't concern myself about how to teach it with children. Just do it. They're going to be, you're, you'd be surprised. They're just easy at it. But using it with them, you're better off you know, making sure they understand the cause and effects, that's important because you're teaching consequences, um, you know, some of those patterns like that. But there's no reason for them, you know, to especially don't want to use normalizations or things like that because you want them to have action. You want them to be able to take action. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, there is one question, one live question from Anne-Laure. A very interesting question. Uh, if possible, could you please ask Kathleen to remind us how the meta model was created, the origin, how Bandler and Grinder decided to create the meta model? Well, it came out of a lot of the different works that they were studying back then in terms of you know, things around uh, transformational grammar and um, the logistics, um, logical, um, I can't think of the word right now. I just went because we're a little off the beaten path, but um, the logic, um, logic and reason. I can't think what the the chunked up term for that is in terms of grammatics, but it's you know when they're studying those things. I mean the people that they had influenced back then, the Kravinsky and um, 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 the uh, Gregory Bateson, and I'm trying to think of the third guy. This, this wasn't what I prepared for. So, but, but you know, definitely people like Gregory Bateson and um, the people that Richard had a strong influence with and conversations with and, and Grinder being a linguistics professor uh, from the first part, um, they really put this together in terms of this came come straight out of that. And also in the transformational grammar, which was really hot back then. So this was around um, the seventies, um, late 70s or so that was like really hot transformational grammar and um, they came out of that working with also other people they modeled like Milton Erickson you know the whole Milton model came out of Milton Erickson and that was about noticing the patterns that he was using and one of the things they noticed is that he was using the patterns of transformational grammar um, he was utilizing the uh, meta model patterns, but rather than asking questions about people using them, he was using them on other people. And that's one of the things in the advanced model that we're going to work on um, is using that inverse meta model. So that's a, a tie in to what we're going to be doing. Um, but that's basically where that came from was um, with uh, Dr. Brender and Dr. Bandler uh, working together with, you know, the linguistics knowledge that uh, Dr. Grinder had, and also with uh, the influences of the people they were working with, uh, like the level of, of Gregory Bateson was genius, absolute genius. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so, much. so much. 
I, I, I know it, it wasn't, it, it's a, a live question and also Laura Spicer is saying, yes, this is a great addition to last night. <laughs> yeah, we had a great masterclass with Laura Spicer and their cyber practice group that they run. Um, yeah, we had a lot of fun playing with it. We played with the meta model, which is always fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. So back to our question here. Yeah, I want to make sure we have time for our event. Yeah, there's a question. Yeah, uh, we, we have um, Bob from Australia who is asking, I have all the tools in NLP, but but I still have many difficulties when facing life change uh, challenges like health issues. How can I use the meta model to overcome them? OK, so this is a two pronged answer, Bob. <laughs> Uh, one prong is, you know, it's really hard to, um, I mentioned this briefly earlier, it's hard to meta model yourself, you know, unless you literally sit there and write out your internal dialogue. And this is an exercise we've had people do in different seminars where you just write out whatever you're saying to yourself. So, wow, I wonder why I'm writing out what I'm actually saying to myself right now. This seems kind of silly, but I'm sitting here writing out this exercise and Everything I say inside my head, I'm going to write down. <laughs> so in the beginning, you start out that way. And then just as your thoughts start to wander, you just keep keep writing and then go back and look at the, um, you know, into the meta model patterns that are there in your own internal dialogue and begin to ask yourself questions about that. Or if you know for a fact that there's things you say to yourself all the time, like, you know, oh, my gosh, I'm getting sick or, oh, my gosh, I don't feel well. That means this or that. Um, so when you think about that and you go, wow, I just trying to build a belief inside of my head, just because I'm a little tired today means I'm probably getting sick. You know, what, <laughs> you know, has there ever been a time I was a little tired and I didn't get sick? You know, these are the kind of questions that you would ask if a client said that to you. Um, so that's one answer, but it's easier when you have somebody outside of yourself asking you good questions. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just easier. Uh, I know myself. And I've been in NLP now for, I don't even know, probably more than 35 years. I keep saying 35 years, so it's got to be more than 35 years. Um, and it's probably closer to 40. And there are some things now that have become very automatic for me. You know, if I start doing the gloom and doom thing or I feel depressed for the moment, um, I go, OK, I'm going to let myself be depressed just for a moment. Go ahead. Have a pity party. Get really good depressed. And. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's done. <laughs> yeah. And I go, okay, now what? Um, so, I mean, there's, you know, things that automatically kick in, you know, I start to feel afraid of something and the picture shifts and something else comes in and I'm swishing myself without even thinking about it now. So um, it does become automatic when you're really good at it and been using NLP. Bob, I don't know what your experience is in terms of who you trained with or how often you're using it now. Um, you know, but if, if you um, can find somebody, uh, you certainly can ask uh, Michelle and Natalie or um, ask me for somebody nearby you um, who might be able to assist you. Health issues are funny. I mean, health issues, you can have the best brain in the world, the best attitude in the world, and um, you can still have a health issue. It's just the nature of being human. And uh, I know that very well myself. And um, you know, and, and but your attitude um, is really what helps you get through these health issues. So you have to really change your belief about those health issues. Um, you know, there's the um, you know the worst case scenario that most people fly to in a, in a health situation. And I know that um, you know your attitude and how you talk about it really makes an impact. Here's the secret: your immune system is listening to everything you say. Um, your immune system is active and it is in connection with your brain and your gut. And so the things you say and the things you feel and the things you do are going to impact them. And, um, you know, whether people are going through medical surgeries or conditions, um, we, we had a, uh, um, um, cosmetic surgeon who was, uh, purchasing, one of our uh, tapes that we had, this is how old the story is, cassette tapes that we had um, on called Convincing Comfort. Now it's a digital file on NLP Eternal. 
but it used to be a cassette tape. <laughs> and, and he was buying them for his patients because he found that if he gave the patient the tape to listen to the week before the surgery, during the surgery and after the surgery, he was finding out that they were healing faster you know, and I, this is not a claim. This is one person's experience. So I'm not making any medical claims here. But the doctor said that his patients were in better spirits going into the surgery, that they were able to control their pain with less medication afterwards. And they were less bleeding during the seminar because they were in this hypnotic, joyful, you know, convincing comfort state. And uh, so, I mean, there's, you know, we can influence things to a certain extent, um, but it certainly doesn't replace you know, having healthy um, activities, whether it be exercise, nutrition, all those fun stuff, and, and, and having a good attitude about it. So I do suggest that, you know, if this is really a serious issue for you, that you find somebody that can help you um, really look at it. Um, but I would first try it yourself to listen to your own internal dialogue and make better choices about what you say to yourself. Um, if you find that you're connecting things through that cause and effect or that complex equivalence all the time about that this means this and this means that and this is going to make this happen, then stop that and change it, break those generalizations and break those distortions so that, you know, you would say that, you know, every time I feel this way, it just means that I'm going to learn something new. So you can build different connections in those, um, those patterns. Thank wow. You. Thank you. Thank um, you. Perhaps, uh, did you have other things you wanted to share with your PowerPoint also? Um, yeah, when uh, we get to the other model. Uh, yeah. Okay, so so the, yeah. the next part is the other model. So perhaps yeah. we'll continue with the questions we'll and then we'll... The questions and we'll, we can take a quick five minute break or something and... Yeah. Yep. Sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. So there's a question from Juan from Bolivia, and he's asking, how can you make the difference between real intuition and mind reading? Woo. Yeah, that's a good one, Juan. <laughs> um, there's a quick and easy answer to that. It's called test. Because, <laughs> you know, there's nothing wrong with mind reading, and there's nothing wrong with intuition. And I don't, sometimes there's no difference between them. There's absolutely no difference between them. But I don't care whether I'm being intuitive or I'm doing a mind read. I'm always, always, always gonna test before I take action. And that's one of the things in the meta model that we're taught as a practitioner is that it's okay to mind read. It's not like it's a bad thing. It's not, remember, there's no violations. <laughs> it's not a bad thing to mind read. The problem comes is when we take action against that mind read and without checking to make sure if you're right. So I don't really see a difference. I think some people are more in tune with their intuition and uh, listen to it better or feel it better or see it better. Um, but we're all intuitive. And I think mind reading a lot of times comes out of that. Um, and it also can be very wrong in some cases. And, um, and then that's what it's a problem. I think yesterday I told a quick, quick story about somebody mind read that uh, everybody at work hated them. And, uh, and when I asked the great question, how do you know, which is the, the question for that meta model pattern, um, they said, oh, because when I go into work, everybody's um, you know at their computer on the phone and I walk in and nobody stops to say, good morning, how are you? Did you see that great show last night? You know, did you have a good weekend? And, uh, and I thinking to myself, you know what my response to her was? My response to her was, you're right. I, I, think, I think you're right. I think they probably all hate you. And she was like, what? <laughs> and I said, well, if you walk in and everybody's at their desk working or on the phone, what does that mean? What, what time do you go in? Are you ever late? She's like, oh, I'm always late. I'm like, well, <laughs> <laughs> that's what they've already done the hi how are you did you have a good evening last night they're done with that now they're out to work and then she sashays in and expects everybody to stop what they're doing to notice her so in that case she was right i said you know what you're right <laughs> they probably all hate you <laughs> but if i didn't check that mind read you know if i bought that and then decided to build for her a method of getting rapport with somebody or a method of negotiating and all this other stuff I would have built for her, 
to get people to like her at work. And that wasn't the case. The case was showing up on time. <laughs> You know, that would, that would fix it all right there. Yeah. You know, so, so the mind reading is so important to, you know, check, test and ask great questions. Now, the difference between intuition and mind reading, I think they're one in the same. Some people just are, are better at it because they're more in tune with it. Can everybody be better with it? Yes. You can learn how to enhance and build your intuition the same way you learn how to build and enhance in NLP training, your submodalities and your and sensory awareness, your sensory acuity, you know, it's all part of the process and you can learn to be even more intuitive. But I don't care how intuitive you are, it's always good to check and test. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, we have Catherine from Israel and Myron from uh, Rep uh, Dominican Republic that are asking, uh, very, yeah. okay. very similar question. Yeah. I am very empathetic person. How can I help someone without getting emotionally involved? And this one I get in every in every seminar. There's an empathetic person that yep. suffers with their client. Yeah, and and you, the biggest problem with that, and, and Catherine and Max, and thank you for asking that question. The, the biggest problem with that is that you are not ineffective at that point. You are not effective because if you get sucked into the content, if you get sucked into the emotions and the states, then you're no longer able to be outside monitoring and asking good questions because your, your brain juice is doing something else. You're getting the bad brain juice in there, the bad feelings. And you want to be able to keep that good brain juice so that you're noticing things and hearing things and feeling things and sensing things. Um, so it's important to be able to have that ability to step back and to and, and not to look uncaring. So somebody goes, well, you know, my life's falling apart. And you go, oh, <laughs> how is that working? For you? It's, like, it's not that you have to be cold and impersonal. You know, it's okay to, to when, when clients are doing things or saying things, I do go inside and try it on. I go inside quickly and I try on that state or that feeling because I want to have a better understanding. But then I have to, you know, take it out, step out of it real fast too. But I do, I do try things on. When clients say things, I pretend I'm saying it and how would I feel if I'm saying that? So the empathy is great to have. But the issue is you have to like, it's try it on, then take it off. <laughs> That's the important part. Now, if you need an exercise to do this, then the important thing is first to build that belief of what your purpose is working with your client and your purpose is to help them. And you have to understand that if you empathize with them, you're not in the ability to help them. So that goes away. So if you truly want to help them, then you have to not, you have to stop that process. In order to stop that process, one of the best things to do, and I do this when I work with clients anyway, is like I told you, I build that feeling of caring and I build that feeling of curiosity, you know, and I, and I have a little excitement too because I know what they're gonna look like in an hour from now or 20 minutes from now or two hours from now. I know what they're gonna look like. So I, I get excited too. And I spin that feeling and I notice which direction it's going in and I spin it and I spin it bigger and faster to where I almost create like a dome around me. So it's almost like a shield, you know, it's like, it just becomes this whole, you know, spinning shield and I can bring it all the way around. So I'm almost like in an energy dome. That way, if anything that they try to send me even, you know, or pull from me even, we all know about emotional vampires and, you know, people that are just sucking, you know, <laughs> anything they can from you um, energetically. So by having this, this great feeling around me and I can see clearly through it, I can feel hear, sense, taste, whatever I have to do, um, but it's a shield. So those things come and they stay right on the shield so that I can identify them and see them. And I say, oh, this is this feeling or, oh, this is this experience. And it stays there and I can, I can sample it. I can feel it. I can try it on, but it doesn't come into me. I build this sort of energetic shield around me and that's a way of protecting. And that's a good thing to do anytime you're working with a client. Um, you know, just to protect yourself. 
Yeah, that's that's an amazing um, tip. <laughs> Thank you. There is also a question from Malaysia, from Akma. And Akma is asking, how do you choose the first question when you challenge the meta model? I don't. I don't choose the first question. My client does. So the, the first question is what my client says. You know, so my, whatever my client says, that's how I choose the question. So it's not like I sit there and think about a question I want to ask, because I won't know until my client actually speaks. So Akma, what, one of the things that is useful is to know our favorite questions or how. So I kind of have that ready, but it's not necessarily my first question, but I always have the how question ready. In fact, I call it the magic how question because it's better for us to know how somebody does something than why they do it, you know, because it's in that process that we can shift and change and distort creativity uh, to build them something new. So how do you do it? You know, what are you doing? How do you do it? Um, even when do you do it is more important information than why. Um, so I always have the how question ready to go. It's locked and loaded, ready to go. But the question I choose is based on whatever they're saying to me. So I don't choose the question. They, they choose it for me based on what they're telling me. Okay. Absolutely. We, we have Philippe from France who is asking, can we use the meta model to eliminate procrastination? Okay. Um, can we use the meta model? Oh, say we skipped a couple questions. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so can we use the meta model to eliminate procrastination? Hmm. I think so. I think because we need to see the process of what's going on. Um, the process of how someone is, you know, obviously I'm assuming you're talking about a client. If you're talking about for yourself, how to use it to stop procrastinating, that's a different case. But if someone is a procrastinator and they're telling you that they want to stop procrastinating, of course, the first part of that is to ask them, what do they want instead? because we don't take stop procrastinating as a goal. Um, or we tell them just put that off for a while, but that, no, it's, <laughs> that's not funny. Um, if they want to stop procrastinating, then what is it that they want to be able to do? Because they don't want it to be in turbo gear 24 seven the rest of their life. That's not what the answer to that is. So um, we can ask them questions about the process because I'm sure that there's something in there, a belief, or an exaggeration or, or a comparative something going on in the meta model patterns that we can change for them. Because people that procrastinate usually make things harder than they have to be in their brain. So you look at the sink full of dishes and a procrastinator will say, oh, that's gonna be so hard, it's gonna take so long, you know, and they start making images of, you know, hours going by and it's really a five minute job. You know, so so in, in, in meta model land, you know, um, we have blown that out of proportion and, and connected it or uh, is a complex equivalence to, you know, sink full of dishes is a lifetime of, of a, a work and, and suffering. You know, it's a complex equivalence. So we have to break that complex equivalence and and help them to understand that, you know, it's a, a, how good will you feel when that's done? Um, and I always amaze myself. Uh, I used to, I'm using this example because I used to do this. I'd walk by the sink full of dishes and I go, oh God, this is going to take an hour, you know? And, and now it's funny because I put my coffee in the microwave in the morning for two minutes. And, um, and if there's anything in the sink, it's usually done between while I'm waiting in that two minutes. And I sit there and go, two minutes, that's amazing. I would have thought this would took at least 15 minutes. It only took me two minutes. <laughs> so I always tell people, you're having problems with that? Actually time when you do get up off the sofa and do it, actually time how much it takes to do it. Because I want to build that complex equivalence in there so that it equals something else other than lifetime of agony. So the sink full of dishes <laughs> equals two minutes as opposed to the sink full of dishes equals a lifetime of agony and, and hard work. So um, you can use you know, the meta model in that respect for things like uh, procrastination. 
uh, whether it's with a client or whether it's with yourself. But that's usually what happens is we, you know, we just connect things that are really ridiculous, you know, and that's what makes us procrastinated because, you know, we don't realize like in comparative deletion land, you know, how quickly it can be done, how easily it can be done. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We also have a question from Lisa from Bulgaria, but I think you already answered it. It was, I see how you can use meta model on other yeah. people, but can you use, can you meta model yourself? Same thing. You yeah. use, if you want to do the uh, internal dialogue exercise, you can, or like I said, it's really important. If there's certain things you know, you say to yourself all the time, you know, you, you wake up and go, oh, this is going to be a, a long day or, you know, any of those things you hear yourself saying, just stop. In fact, the best way to do it is actually to scream that word inside your head, not out loud, they'll scare the other people in the house. <laughs> but, you know, if you hear yourself going, oh, this is going to be a long day, then just literally go stop inside your head and go, <sighs> okay. So what's the first thing we're going to do today? You know, because the fact is you got up and that should be a celebration in itself. You know, um, as some people say, it's a, any day above ground is a good day. You know, so <laughs> just enjoy that fact and look at what's what's next. What are you going to do next? What's the first thing you're going to do? Take one thing at a time. Yeah, absolutely. Michael is asking, how did you develop your approach to uh, for the meta model over time to where you have it today two things one was um as i said when i first started learning nlp it was before i was training directly with dr bamler i had taken um crack and uh, and a, a master crack with an institute one of um the primary people in in the society of nlp working with, with directly with dr bamler a student and um but it wasn't training directly with dr bandler and that's when i learned the, the meta model as an abusive tool <laughs> and then when i first started training directly with dr bandler which was probably in my second year of studying nlp we started going to dr bandler's events and it was like night and day it was like oh my god like suddenly you know it was um a puzzle it was a um and a journey it wasn't a, a tool or a weapon you know it was a discovery process and um it just it opened up my whole approach then as i became a trainer and i got uh we're doing all these trainings we have all these people coming in to seminars with dr bandler from all different places from all different trainers uh from places outside the the licensed society of nlp and, and it was, and I kept seeing that pattern. The people outside of the of the, the society were, you know, and even some in the society that had, haven't trained directly with Dr. Bandler were, were teaching this in this, you know, horrible way. And it just made me mad. It literally just angered me that this was being taught this way. And so it became one of my pet projects to make it more and more fun um, easier to understand and more accessible. The biggest thing, if any of you are trainers out there, the biggest thing is if you're going to explain something to someone, give them the experience first. You know, give them the experience first before you even tell them the label. And that's the biggest problem with the meta model. I guarantee you, if I took a poll right now with everybody out there, everybody would go, Oh, I know the meta model, but I can't tell you the names of the, the thing. That's that thing where it's like two things, but like one makes the other, but I don't know what it's called. <laughs> you know? And it's like, okay. And I'm thinking, and I kept thinking to myself, why is that so difficult to understand? Why can't people remember these titles? And then it hit me and it dawned on me after having some conversations with Richard and, and talking to John, my husband uh, about it. And, and I realized that it was not giving people the experience first. So when I teach the meta model, you know, then I give them an example of the pattern before telling them what the pattern is. And then I talk about the pattern. And, and then I tell them what the title is. And I also use anchoring. So, you know, I have anchors like for the different patterns. I use a physical hand anchor for the different patterns so that 
later on, if I say the pattern, I just use the anchor and they go, oh, complex equivalence. This is my anchor for complex equivalence. <laughs> and everybody's like, and I go, so what's this pattern? <laughs> and I say the sentence and they go, oh, complex equivalence. <laughs> but what I do is, for example, that, so I would say, you know, time is money, you know, success is happiness. And, um, and I explain like, how can these two things be one and the same? How can they be equal? Time, some hallucinated concept. Money, you know, is um, paper or, or coin, metal, or now digits on a computer. But I have to upgrade my trainings now in this day and age. But um, so how are these two things one and the same? Something pretty complex must have happened in order for these two things to be equal. Complex, equal. So then when I say, what are we going to call this title? Or what a pattern? And I go, oh, complex equivalence. Now it's like it makes sense to them. But if I said up front, okay, so the next pattern is complex equivalence. A complex equivalence is when you have, the, as soon as you say the word complex equivalence, they're inside their head going, what the hell is that? What the hell does that mean? Complex, that, that means difficult. An equivalent, what is that? So now they're doing this thing in their head when you're trying to teach them. And confusion is not the best state for learning. I think we found that out. <laughs> so, you know, so it, it really, it, for me, all of these things together um, came up with my mission <laughs> to make NLP meta model patterns more fun, easily um, described, and easily remembered, so that you know my students, you know, can tell you what a pattern is. Not all of them, one hundred percent of the time, but <laughs> my students can tell you <laughs> what a pattern is. And, and they don't go freaking out because they can't remember the patterns and they're afraid to use it. That's not the goal of it. This is the, the most important tool. So it should be easy to use and fun to use. And that's my mission and my goal, my approach. Thank you. There is uh, one last question. I think we'll, we can combine two of the questions which are uh, actually going exactly to the same direction from Isabel from France and from Dang from uh, from other country. So he didn't specify where he's from. Um, so the, the question is, how much time do you need to master the meta model? And the challenge is, if you had 30 days to become a master of meta model, what would you intensively practice? Well, how much time do you need to master the meta model? I don't know. I'll let you know, because I don't consider that I've mastered it. So I don't know. I'll let you know when I get there how long it took. Um, in, in seriousness, it's, I don't look at mastering um, as an end game, as an end um, limit. So to me, mastering it is continuing to work within it, develop it, build with it, play with it. And um, it, I always think of those movies. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Airplane. It's a very funny movie back from the 70s. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. yeah, Airplane. And it's like, every time I've seen that movie, and I've seen it probably about 12 times, every time I see that movie, I notice something else in the background, you know, that I didn't notice the first 12 times I saw it. I find something else in there, some a little sign in the background that I didn't notice or something that somebody said off in the distance or, you know, and it's like, you know, <laughs> yeah. because every time you approach something with your level of information and your level of filters, you're able to gain more. This is why I tell people, you know, I, I've had instances where people go, you know, I really want to practice the practitioner more. And I go, take it again. And they go, oh no, I don't want to take the practitioner course again. I already did it, you know? And I'm like, some of the best trainers I know on this planet, you know, didn't just do one practitioner, one master practitioner, show up at the trainer's training. The best trainers on this planet, you know, in, including myself, I took about six maybe practitioners, probably about five master practitioners um, before I went to trainer's training. And then I, and I know things are more fast now. Everybody wants more <laughs> instant uh, gratification more so, but, but it's about when you walk in, you're at a different level. When I sit in a practitioner, when Richard's training in the morning, John and I are usually in the back of the room and we're maybe working on our computer or I'm going through the files for the, you know, the people in the room that are at the seminar, but I'm always listening and watching. And, and it's like, 
every single time, even after almost 40 years, I still make a connection that goes, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I know, it's like I never heard him say that before. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but it's like something new, a new connection because our filters are changed, our levels are changed. So when we go in at that level, you get more. So for the same thing with mastering the meta model, it's like I find when I'm sometimes in the middle of teaching something, I realize, oh, wait, it would be easier if I do this. <laughs> or here's a better example. So I'm not done mastering the meta model. So I don't know how long it takes. Uh, I do know that if you wanted to set a 30 day goal for yourself to improve your ability to use the meta model, <laughs> um, then I would do what we said earlier write the patterns out. Write them, write them, write them, write them, write them. There's magic in that. And I think we spend a lot of time doing this or this. And um, it's great to go back and do some of that too. And if that really upsets you, fine. I'll, like I said, I'll, I'll take this. <laughs> but write the patterns. Um, by generating the patterns, you will master them because it's a whole different part of the brain and get involved. Um, you're using more of the systems you know, with the visual, the auditory, the kinesthetic combined. Um, not everybody realizes this, but reading, you know, um, people think reading is, is visual and um, it's so auditory, it's not even funny. Um, it's, a, it's a synesthesia pattern of visual and auditory because, you know, the, the whole thing with speed reading, and Michelle, you know all about this, <laughs> but the whole thing about speed reading is that, you know, the problem with people reading slow is because they can only read as fast as they can talk because they're talking to themselves the whole time they're reading. So when you shut off the auditory channel, then you can pick up the speed of, of reading. So it's, it's so important to pull, if you really want to immerse in the information, is to pull all that together and use that, that kinesthetic and really, really build the patterns. The more you write them, the more you'll use them, the more you'll hear them and recognize them. And I say that for any of the patterns in NLP. I tell people with the ambiguities, sit there and write phonological ambiguities, syntactic ambiguities, scope ambiguities, you know, punctuation ambiguities, write them out. Um, you know, and if you have the ability to sit with someone and, and trade them back and forth, that's always fun. Um, but it's that generating, the more you can generate them, the more you'll use them and the more you'll hear them and recognize them easily. Thank you. So we have comments on YouTube. We have, we have Mark who asked a question which you answered. He said that this is a delight. We have Jane who is saying love your approach, Kathleen. There is Carol who said brilliant. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you very much for all those questions. And thank you for the answers, Kathleen. Uh, now it's time to play, huh? Yeah, now it will be time to play. Do you need a break, Kathleen? Um, I just, I tell you what, if you don't mind, we take a two or three minute break. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure that the contractors are down the other okay. end before I start this next piece. So, so I'm going to gently so we'll, move them in their ladders. <laughs> excellent. So we'll just take, like, uh, uh, yeah, two, three minutes. You can just, uh, yeah, or we, we can just leave the the camera on or you can switch it off as you wish and just two minutes perhaps just to to say a few words um just remember to to subscribe to the channel remember also to to write some comments about the master class because it's very interesting for people who are looking at the video to see what are the reflections people have about the content we have uh, also John Johnson, who is uh, saying hi. Uh, actually, it's it's amazing those master classes that we have had uh, that we are having. We we really want to to give you guys uh, content, very useful content, so that we can all learn and go further with our comprehension of what NLP is. Yeah. And what comes next with the advanced approach of the meta model is something that is very, uh, very targeted, very specific. It's even as some content that you, uh, it's hard to get even in the trainings because those are very specific extra contents. So just 
make a good use of it and Kathleen is back. <laughs> We're all being good. <laughs> Excellent. So Kathleen, what have you prepared for us? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, let's look at, let me just go back to sharing screen for a moment. Um, Okay, so we're going to skip the review because you guys knew the meta model or you yes the meta model. So what I'd like you to look at is something that comes from. Um, for, for the moment, we don't have the share at the, the share oh. the share screen okay. That's so funny. to let oh. you know. All right, hold on one second. Yeah. Because I hit the button that says that. Huh. Weird. All right. Huh. Share screen. Mm -hmm. Now you have to select I did. the screen. Okay, okay. now it's coming. Now, good? now right. it's coming. Yes, we have it. Okay. Perfect. All right. So we we talked a little bit about the the whole notion of how meta model is formed in terms of from the experience to deep structure to the surface structure and the filters in, involved in there. So we have the categories, deletions, distortions, generalizations. So we're going to skip the actual, all the singles. And I want to tell you about um, another metaphor, which is a true life experience, how these things happen, is I was on a trip to Japan. And I had already been working on building that second uh, piece of you know the meta model in terms of um, utilizing it as opposed to just listening for it and asking questions. So this is the inverse meta model. So this is kind of a Mobius. You know, if you look at the one side of the model and the other side of the meta model. So with this particular model, we're looking at the inverse meta model of understanding it. But it's also about working with the client at the same time. And I'll explain how that makes sense in a moment. Um, but I was on this trip to Japan, and it was um, uh, we had a couple of days off in between trainings. So uh, we went to Kyoto, which is my favorite place in Japan, and we did what we call temple hopping. <laughs> we went to every temple we could find, and we went and visited and experienced. And we were walking along this river um, after dinner one night. And it was a beautiful river in Kyoto with all these little bridges that go across. And the little bridges were just for foot traffic only, not cars. And I said, wow, that's really cool. You, you have so many of these little bridges where people can just go stand on the bridge and watch the river go by. And they said, oh, well, wait, if you were here during the Festival of Fabric, it would be even more beautiful. And I was like, Festival of Fabric? So <laughs> tell me about that in the old days when they used to work with the kimono material where they would dye these kimonos material beautiful colors and the one thing about dyeing cloth is you have to set it in cold water so the dye sets and it doesn't bleed you know when when you're uh, working with the fabric later on and and he said this is a perfect river and i said what do you mean he goes well it's the perfect temperature it's always cold rivers are always cold they don't get warm like a swimming pool does or even the ocean does Rivers always stay cold. So it's a perfect system. It's a cold water and it always goes in the same direction. And it always goes about the same speed in all time of year in Japan. So it's the perfect system. So they built the place that dyes the fabrics up river and they would take the fabrics, lay it on the surface of the water on the river and let it travel down. Now they knew how long they wanted the fabric to be in the water to set so they could calculate by the distance and the speed of the river 
where to build the other place that was going to collect the fabric, hang it up to dry, and then cut and make these beautiful kimonos. And I thought about that. I said, what a perfect system. You know, they could have made this really difficult. They could have made like, you know, the plant up there and, and then maybe put the other place next to it, but then they have to go out and get, the, you know, or they could have to put it in a cart and um, have, have to carry it down the, uh, the, you know, the side of the river. They have to travel with a cart and the horses to drag the fabrics down to the other place to be, but no, no, they had the perfect system in front of them. So they decided to use what worked. They decided to use the perfect system right there. So they put the fabric in, the fabrics would travel down the river, the other side at the right time would pull them out, dry them, cut them, sew them. Perfect. And it was gorgeous. People would travel just to see all this beautiful colored fabric floating on the surface of the river. It was gorgeous. So it was, it was just, and they still don't, I mean, they don't do it that way anymore. Now everything's automated and faster and, um, but they still once a year have this fabric festival where they reenact that process and people travel to see all this beautiful fabric floating down the river. So I thought about that and I was already working on this system because one of the things I know is that, especially now I'm a new grandma, um, my granddaughter is, uh, um, eight months now and and I, I'm watching this and I, I'm lovingly saying I'm watching this machine fire up and develop and learn and grow and do crazy things um, and it's the same thing that I've known when I worked on this model is that when we're a human being and we're dropped into this planet here we are we're immediately sampling we're immediately tasting, smelling, feeling, listening, getting a sense for our world. And, and that's what we call the environment. It's the environment we live in. And the environment is, is a, just a, a world of stimulus response mechanisms. You know, we touch this, it's soft. We touch this, it's hard. We touch this, it's hot. We don't like the feel of that. Um, we, we don't like the bright lights, but, you know, we like things that are moving and, and colors and things moving around. Um, we don't like loud, sudden noises, but we like silly singing and, and adults walking up to us and going, doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> and we like that and we laugh and we go, ha ha. So we start working all this stimulus response things and that's in the world of the environment. So if we look at this, this is where we start as human beings. We start in this level of environment and it is the land of stimulus response. Now, we touch something and it's hot. We touch something and it's hot. Now we gotta do something because it's there's gonna be hot things in the world. So we learn to build strategies to, to deal with, to exist in this stimulus response land. So we, we go, oh, we put a, a mitt, an oven mitt on our hand and we can touch the hot thing. Oh, cool. So we, we build strategies. As babies, we figure out that if we crinkle up our nose and start to go, that somebody's going to come over and go, you know, what's wrong? And you want your diaper changed or you want some food or, or you're just bored, you know? So we start building strategies. Uh, you know, we push how the limits are. We see how far we can push the limits. So we try and do things to get reactions. And we're still working off those stimulus response, but now it's a higher level function in the brain. We've moved up one level. Now we're not just like, ow. Now we're like, hmm, <laughs> how do I get rid of the ow? How do we work around the ow? How do I get what I hmm, want? <laughs> so once we run strategies and we get some good results, we start to build that generalization in there. The patterning comes in. And we go, oh, you know what? This works. This makes this easier. This makes this better. So we start to build beliefs from seeing the results of these strategies running. And that's another level function again. So now we're growing in brain. So first we're in the world, touching, feeling, eating, tasting, smelling things. We start building ways to deal with those stimuluses. And then we start categorizing and saying, 
oh, this is a good strategy. This makes this easier. This makes this better. This, this gets me what I want. And we build beliefs. Now, from running those beliefs in our brain, we start to react differently down the chart. Our activities change down here based on these beliefs. But what happens is the next level function comes up is because now when we run this belief, we run this belief, we run this belief, and certain things start popping out that are similar. So, you know, we go, it's good to put a glove on your hand before you touch a hot thing. That's a, that's a belief. It's good to do that because it makes me safe. Oh, it's, it's good to put two hands on the end table when I try and walk instead of just trying to walk free right now when I was a toddler, you know, because that makes me safe, you know. So we start building these beliefs and certain things keep popping up that are similar. And we go, you know, I kind of like this safe stuff. I'm going to value this. Now we really change a lot of things under here um, based on these values. So, but this is another higher level function. So this is the normal way our brain develops things. This is the normal way people say, how do you build a value? You know, it's the stimulus responses that you have in the world, how you work with them, what beliefs pop out of that, and then what patterns are similar in terms of the things we want. Communication, love, um, you know, warm, full and dry, all that stuff. These are the things that we then value. So this is a higher chunk. It's a higher brain function. Now, I love this. Somebody actually asked me in the masterclass yesterday. Um, we didn't spend as much time on this model, but I showed them the beginning of it. And, and somebody said, what if you get your values from your parents? And I said, yeah, but how? Magic how question in meta model. How did you get the value from your parents? And they went, well, I heard them say things. <laughs> and then there were certain things I did that I was told no or yes. <laughs> and then I started to believe that this was important. So, you know, you could say, yeah, I get you get your values from your parents or your clergymen or your friends or your whatevers but the way that you build it is up this path that you know somebody told you you heard it or you also saw them as models you saw them doing the things down here in the environment and they were showing you how to do things in that value and then you know they because you it was running and it was running and they look good doing it and you look good doing it it felt good you go, you know what, this stuff's pretty good, this value. I think I do need to value love or I do need to value helping people or whatever it is. And that moves you up to values. So this is the normal process. I don't care how you got your values or who you got your values from. This is the process you had to run it through to get to that level of brain function. Hmm. So now, what does this mean? <laughs> and I have a question. Yeah, sure. May I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, in other models above values, we see also sometimes identity and also spirituality. Uh, right. What is your opinion about their presence or absence? Sure. Okay, so let, this is similar to what you might see in uh, logical levels or other models that are out there in NLP. And, and it's different because first of all, a lot of them put beliefs and strategies on the same box and they're not. They're two different brain function levels. This is on the function of the brain, level of the brain. They're two different, so they don't belong in the same box. Or I've seen it where beliefs and values are the same box um, and they're not, they're completely different because one yields the other. This one yields this, this one yields this. Now you could argue, um, the identity box that I chose um, to leave out on purpose is because what you do, how you do it, what you believe, and what you hold important is certainly going to have an impact on who you are as a person. Because to me, it's here. It's your actions that really is the most important place, what you do. I don't care if you want to see your identity as um, I don't know, let's pick an identity. Um, there are people out there that, that would say that they're a, um, empathetic, um, philanthropist, whatever, blah, blah, blah. 
I don't care what you call yourself. I want to know what you do and how you do it. That's what's important to me. Okay. And I also have a knee jerk reaction to putting someone's identity in a box. I see this as more of a fluid model. So for me to, to say, now I have to decide who I am as a person and then put a box around it and a name to it. I, I don't think that helps people. So I purposely left that out. Now, spirituality, anything, even the, the intuition we were talking about, where do you think intuition is on here? Where do you think intuition might be on here? I'm gonna answer the question, but I'm asking for everybody to consider that. And Michelle or Natalie, if you wanna answer that question, you can. But where do you think intuition is on here? For me, it's a combination of all because there's there are elements from the environment environment that are going to influence the uh, intuition. You have also, a strategy the, for it. Yes. Then you confirm it with your beliefs and yeah. you construct yeah. a, a yeah. value. Your intuition is down in here. Your yeah. intuition is down in here. Now, some people's beliefs will stop them from getting the information because they don't believe they're intuitive or they think it's woohoo stuff going up to values. Somebody mm. told them, oh, intuition is like witchcraft. Ooh, that's bad stuff. You know, So we shouldn't be talking about those things. So that might stifle this, but your intuition is down here. And certainly the beliefs and values you hold will help you work with that more. But absolutely, you know. so that's why I stop at values because this to me is the way the brain progresses. This is more about brain development and level of brain function than the what logical levels and all that other stuff proposes to do. Because my issue with those is that A, they're not chunked properly, and B, in my opinion, and B, you know, going up to this level of, you know, I, I had a trainer once you know, was teaching, um, um, I forget what it was, I think it was the Claire Graves model or something. And he was like, oh, well, you know, because I'm actually level, you know, I think it went up at that time. It only went up to level 12 or something. And he goes, well, I'm actually a level 14, but they haven't defined that yet because you know, it was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> please. You know? So this is where I stop because this is about the brain. And that's what we do in NLP. Um, I certainly help people hold themselves to high uh, identity. But I, anybody's identity, I can describe down here, yeah. you know, how they live their life, what they do. And, you know, the beliefs and values are their opinion, you know, unless they try and sell them to other people that, and it's not useful. But, um, you know, this is to me where, where all the action is. And yeah. that's the judge for me of someone is what they do, how they do it. So. Yeah. Uh, I really appreciated that. That's what, that's a really a key point that it's not about what you say you are. It's about what you do. And I think yeah. this really is a great answer. Thank I you. also think that uh, it, it it has also to to be connected with your beliefs because if you believe you are a good person, you are going to have a good. Uh, behavior or if you believe that you are able to mm. you are going to become what what you believe until okay. somebody calls you on your stuff yeah. <laughs> you might believe you're a good person but uh, if you're not doing you know the right actions, things, absolutely yeah. someone's going to call you out on it sooner or later and then you're going to have to re-examine that belief yeah. check it against your values <laughs> And yeah. you might have to change the way you do something. Absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so thank, you. thank you for that answer. No, you're yeah. welcome. So you have this grid, right? Okay. So what the heck does this have to do with meta model? Everything. Because I have people in, in class tell me, oh, um, a client comes in and they say that they want this. How do I know whether I should do a belief change or collapsing anchors or timeline? or change personal history. So what I noticed that when your client is speaking, if you're paying attention to not only the meta model patterns, but where they are on this chart, you're gonna find out where you have to change something. So if they're using something like, you know, um, every time I try to succeed, I fail. So that's a what universal quantifier. Every time I try to succeed, I fail. So are they in environment or strategies? Where do you think they are? 
So they're up in the land of beliefs. Yeah. Now, this belief was built because every time they tried, they failed. Every time they tried, they failed. Every time they tried, they failed. And when they kept failing, then they built the belief that says, you know what? Every time I try to succeed, I fail. So it's definitely a belief. Now, when we get some of the others in here, we're going to understand a little more of the process. But universal, um, universal quantifier is definitely up in the land of beliefs. Now, if they say something like, um, you know, when I, when I um, try to talk to somebody, it makes me feel uncomfortable. So when I try to talk to somebody, it makes me feel uncomfortable. So they're not able to do job interviews. They're not able to ask their boss for a raise. I mean, they're having problems because when they try and talk to somebody about something important, it makes them feel uncomfortable. So that's still here, right? But think about that process. Now, if they had that belief that when I try to succeed, it makes me fail. When I try to succeed, it makes me fail. When I try to succeed, it makes me fail. You know what? Every time I try to succeed, I fail. So now you can feel that the universal quantifier is actually a higher function than simple cause and effect. Yes. So, a, so a cause and effect is still a belief, but it's a little bit lower than the universal quantifier. You have a bigger problem to unravel when somebody gives you the universal quantifier, but sometimes it's easier actually to unravel because you can just get one counterexample and it blows the whole thing away. The cause and effect, you might have to work a little harder, but the, but the complex equivalence has to be broken first because it's a higher belief and you can fight this one to the cows come home if you don't take care of the universal quantifier first, if, there's, if that's what your client is telling you. So you listen for the belief uh, patterns like cause and effect, universal quantifier, okay? Um, let's take a, a, a simple one. So if somebody says um, that uh, they wanna learn faster, so if they wanna learn faster, the simple NLP question of, of, um, for meta model patterns would be, you know, how fast are we talking about? How much faster? Faster than what? You know, those are what? Comparative deletions. And we're talking about strategy land. Yeah. So the comparative deletions are down here in, in that respect. And so now you can argue that, well, they believe they're not learning fast enough or something like that's a whole different ballgame. When they say the sentence, I need to learn faster, I wanna learn faster, um, I need a faster strategy of learning, a faster way of learning, we're down here in strategy land. So just by listening to them talking, you already know that if they're giving you cause and effects and complex equivalences, you know it's time for a belief change. That's where your NLP is gonna happen. You know, if they're using patterns like the, the you know, comparative deletions, things like that, then you know that you have a better chance working within the strategies or submodality shifts, things like that. So this gives you a hint. Um, if, uh, by the way, something like a collapsing anchor, since this is the land of stimulus response, collapsing anchors, you can do down here in that because you're just having them pick a different response to the stimulus. In, and listening to how they describe it will tell you whether or not you're gonna to have to go up to belief or you can just simply help them to cancel out and choose a different way of responding to that stimulus. But especially with collapsing anchor issues, a lot of times it isn't an issue of um, they're afraid of that voice or they're, um, you know, it's triggering something, but it's just, it, it drives them nuts. They can't stand it. You know, whether it's somebody chewing near them, they can't stand or whether, you know, it's just a whiny voice they can't stand um, or the time clock moving very slowly in a long line. Um, you can have them pick a different response to that. So those kind of things can be done when it's a stimulus response issue can be done down in the environment. So by listening to your client, you have an idea of where you're gonna be doing the work of, you know, what level of function they're at when they're describing either what it is they want or the issue that they have when they first tell you. Um, so let's look at some of the other patterns. So nominalizations, where do you think nominalizations lie? And that's Absolutely a, a value. Value. Yeah. They're all values. 
communication, respect, love, <laughs> safety, you know, um, those are all uh, nominalizations. So the nominalizations are up in the land of values up in here. Um, let's see, uh, mind read. What do you think mind read is? They don't like me, they don't, whatever. For me, it's a, it's a belief that could be connected to a strategy because exactly. in order to guess that, you need the strategy. That's yeah. a lower, right. And when you ask the good meta model question, as you do as practitioners, when you ask the good meta model question about the mind read, how do you know? They're probably going to give you a what? A strategy. A strategy for how they figured it out. So you say, how do you know they hate you? They're going to go in and tell you how they figured it out. They're going to give you a strategy. Now, if they give you another belief and don't give you the strategy, then you know there's a serious issue there, that somehow they're connecting, you know, that in all these situations, I'm going to be, <laughs> I'm going to be a mess. In all these situations, I'm going to have a hard time. So it gives you a lot of information. But nine times out of 10, they're going to, when you ask the question, how do you know they hate you? They're going to drop down and give you the strategy. <laughs> Okay, so then you can change their strategy, or you can just do the belief change and shifting that it might mean something else. You know, it might not mean that they hate you, it might mean something else. Um, or you can have them, you know, build a different strategy for how they're making these jump conclusions um, when they're not useful. If they're good mind reads, then congratulate them that they've got a great strategy, <laughs> but it may not solve the problem, but that usually gives you information as to what they need to be doing differently. So. Okay, so we have mind read, we have nominalizations, uh, loss performative. It's good to be things. It's good to do things the right way. It's bad to do things the wrong way. That would be, be between yeah. beliefs and values? Um, beliefs and values. It's good it to, would, to... Yes. So the, the loss performative is definitely a belief. And it's a high belief because you're pitting that belief against the values, the things that you hold near and dear. Yeah. You're pitting that belief against the values. So absolutely. Yep. Okay, so um, modal operator possibility. I can. I can do it. That, that would be, um, I, I would say, strategy between strategy and belief, because I can do it. I have a strategy. So I built a belief that I can. Right. So the belief is here. It's a belief. I can do it. You believe you can do it. But it's based off of a strategy. You've done it or you know how to do it. So you say, I can do it. Mm -hmm. So now you have a belief, modal operator possibility. Now, what about a modal operator of necessity? I need, I must, I have to. That's value. Belief value, yeah. Right. Now you have the, the modal operator jumps because when, what are your needs? Your needs are your value. So that's the important part is that you have the needs and that raises the level of the, val of the belief. So where you have modal operator possibility is it's just coming off the strategy. Modal operator of necessity is a belief reaching up to, I need, I need, reaching up to your values. Now, some of these are important because they're transition for, uh, patterns. So can, by the way, is a transition pattern. So if I was working with a client and we built a new strategy for them, I'm going to use a modal operator of possibility to help them build a strong belief. Because the problem with this model is that if you do a belief change and then you go five bucks, pay me, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't work that cheap, but you know, if you go, here's your new belief. Congratulations. Time's off up. <laughs> off you go. Now what happens if you haven't attached this belief to what a value that they have. Now you have a belief that's like, ooh, it's just sort of hanging in midair. Mm -hmm. Then what happens when they go back to the environment and the first time that they try to do something, all of a sudden they don't have a strategy for working with that new belief. That's a problem. 
that's a problem. So when you make a belief change with someone, you help them to change the belief that they have, then you've got to make sure that they know how to live with, that they know what value it's attached to. So because you have this new belief, it just means you're going to have more time for the family or whatever value you know from doing your well-formed outcome, you know what it's attached to, that you'll have more time with the family now. And as you see yourself spending time with the family, notice how you can plan, you know, better vacations or more vacations or longer vacations or, and then you can still have time for your work and you, you know, you plan out your, your week that you have time for this time for that. And then you can build that sense of back to that, that belief that you just did. So it's important that when you're, you're in baseball, we call it, you got to touch all four bases for a home run. You know, so it's important that wherever you make the change for your client, that you go back and you touch all four bases, whether the belief you turn into value, you can future pace down on the environment, make sure they have a way of living with this new belief, and then back to the belief. If you did a strategy change, then you need to move up to belief so that they believe this new strategy is going to be good and it's going to get them what they want and you can future pace in the environment back to where you did the new strategy. So you're touching all four bases. So how do you move somebody from strategies to beliefs? Because you got to move them to all four bases. So by using a meta model pattern. So now that you have this faster way of learning, notice how you can learn faster and easier. This will make things more, you'll have more information available to you. It will make it easier to get better jobs, to get whatever, blah, blah, blah. So by using the CAN pattern, the mobile operator possibility, you can move somebody from strategies to beliefs. By you, and each and every time you run this new strategy, it will only move you closer to the things you desire. So I'm using a universal quantifier to move up in the beliefs land closer to values. So by using the meta model patterns, you can move somebody to a different level of thinking by utilizing, that's the inverse meta model. Make sense? You have any questions on that? No, I have just a, a, a big <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, so that's the thing that, that makes this magic, as I'm saying, is because when your client's talking to you, you can be following. I used to just have one of these blank grids. And I invite any of you out there, there is a copyright on it, but I invite any of you out there to make up little, little cards for yourself if you're seeing clients with these four boxes. And when your client is talking, just get used to tracking where they are. And you can put little, little notes here that the phrase they said, when, and number them if you want. First they said this, and then they said this, and then they're here. I mean, so I would track my clients where they were on this chart. And by listening to the meta model patterns, I knew where they were going. And then when I decided where the best change piece was going to be, then I knew to go to all four boxes. And we call this creating generative change. Because if you just do a value shift and they have no clue how to live in the environment with this new value or how to do it or what to even think about it, then it's only going to work until it doesn't. And those of us that have worked with clients, we know. We've had clients where three weeks later, three months later, they call us up and they go, I was doing so good. It was great. And then it all unraveled. Well, this is a way of hedging your bets, as we call it, or stacking the deck so that those things don't happen. Because I can guarantee you something was changed, but they didn't have a functional way of working with it. And the first time a big stimulus came along, their response was, <laughs> oops. <laughs> and then it just all collapsed like a deck of cards, like a house of cards. So it's important that you touch all four boxes when you're building and how you move somebody from here to here or here to here or here to here is by literally using the meta model patterns that will take them to that area. Excellent, excellent. Are there any questions on the YouTube? Wow, I, I, I do have a question. Uh, you you mentioned 
um, the the future pacing, uh -huh. and uh, sometimes we we tend to do the future pacing, getting out of this uh, of this river, in the environment uh, level. Is there a, a rule? Is there um, best practice. a best practice um, if you begin in in the belief with the client you you touch all four bases following this 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 river and then you go you, you future pace at the belief level what, what would be your your recommendation on that well first of all keep in mind that this is all happening you know during and after um, you've done all the desired state work. So you have to ask all those desired state questions to get all that information that we get because there's gems in there. There's really great information. So it's important to not put that aside and just go to this. So because all of this information down here into how they want to do it in the future pacing all comes from that information you gathered in the well-formed desired state part of the, the interaction with them. So it's important that you know all that still happens uh, because that's where the, all the gems are. So you know what to trigger off in the future pacing because you know you've put them in a desired state, and um, and you know the magic of the desired state is is that when when you get someone in the well formed part a well formed goal and you have them try on the desired state because you're doing it so that you know it's testable. You want to get all the sub modalities what they'll look like, what they'll sound like, what they'll feel like, how other people will react to them. You're gathering all that information in the well-formed outcome, in the well-formed desired state. And that is the part that goes in the future pacing so that once you've done this and you got them in the environment, you say, so go out to the next time in the future, when in the past, it might've been a problem, but notice now how when you walk into the room, you know, you're standing a certain way, your voice sounds a certain way, you feel a certain way, notice the people around you were saying wow you know you look great today or whatever it is you know so you have all the information to put in there you know the things they've tried in the past that didn't work and now the things that you built in instead the better strategy or whatever so all of that is is really you know from doing the desired state work correctly right from the beginning so that's you know the importance there um the um Working with this and getting used to it comes from getting familiar, as I said, generating the meta model patterns. That's the important part. If you generate those meta model patterns, then if you'll have no problem generating them to go up and down this values chart. You know, that'll just mm -hmm. be a, uh, they say, the, um, how do you say that, Michelle? The, 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 the complete, uh, when you say, when they say fate to complete or something, oh. it's a done deal. It's a, <laughs> yeah. in French, there's a word, a phrase for that. You say it's a done deal. It's it's going to happen. Um, the whole enchilada. The whole enchilada. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but it's not <laughs> French. <laughs> I think it's fate, fate to complete. I'm probably saying it wrong. Um, but it's a, it's a whole process. of yeah. it, it just becomes... Um, in, in you know a, uh, a done deal as we say in the states um, so you can build that process in there um, mm. by just simply being comfortable using the patterns and knowing where they're taking you knowing the, the, the direction of each one to the other yeah <clears throat> and there is a very interesting part about this model that we, we could experience also during the last training in hypnosis that uh that we had not a long time ago, where you also proposed to use that model to generate uh, trance states and yeah. going through the environment and strategy, belief and value. And that was quite amazing. That was the first time I was hearing that uh, that idea and it worked really great. Yes, it, it's yeah. it's a magical in that respect of, because it's about how the brain works. It's about how our brain functions, you know, and um, the other piece in that seminar that we did too with the, the building states, you know, because um, if you want someone to be excited about the process and they're fearful of the process, 
curiosity works best. You know, so if you build a strong sense of curiosity so that they become curious about how good it's going to be if they finish this, you know, process or if they, how good is it going to be? And then some people need permission that they know that they can do it, which is the belief that, you know, it's possible that they can do it. So you can literally um, work down here in hypnosis with all of the um, simple, you know, that's what we do in, in, in Milton model. You know, you, you don't talk about the exact feeling of the cushion of the chair, but you say, you know how that chair feels right now. You don't say how it feels good or it feels bad because you don't know what the person's experiencing. So you use your deletions and you talk about that chair or that feeling or that sensation, you know, and then you're giving them a, a strategy for the way that they can compare so that they're going to go deeper into trans comparative deletion you know, that they're, they're going to, you know, experience trance, unspecified verb. That's where unspecified verb lives, by the way, because uh, you're talking about things like learning or relaxing or trancing or whatever it is. So that, you know, they realize that they can, you know, accomplish the things they want to in this trance because it's good for them, <laughs> but it gives them the things they want. So it's just, you could take anything in NLP and put it, you can take anything in any subject and put it in this model because it's how the brain thinks in chunks and layers. It's, you know, just each one is a little higher function. And especially when we look at the meta model patterns, it gives us even more information in here. Because as we said, there's mind reading. Another function to that is the cause and effect. Another function higher is when we connect it to, to be a universal quantifier. And then, the every time, I didn't mention this before, so let's take that again. So mind reading, first level of belief. Then we get up to and go, well, you know what? This makes this happen. So now we got the cause and effect. And this makes this happen. And this makes this happen. You know what? Every time this happens, every time when we do this make thing, it, it happens. Now we got the um, universal quantifier. Now, if you do this every time this happens, every time this happens, every time this happens, you know what? This is that. And that's the complex equivalence. So the, this is that is the result of all those other things. So it's the next level up again. So when you put the meta model patterns in here, it gives you higher levels of function and explains how people do that. Because that always cracked me up with, with complex equivalences. You're like, how did you come up with that? How did you make that happen? How is that equal to that? How did you do that? Well, it's quite simple because if you if you had the time and wanted to and desired to actually chunk them back down, you would find exactly what happened from the environment, the stimulus responses and how they tried to work with it. And then they started building these, chunking up with these beliefs, chunking up with these beliefs to the point where they just went, you know what? It's hopeless because you know, this is that anyway, so I'm never going to attain it. And that gives them the excuse why they can't have what they want. Yeah. Hmm. Very, very interesting. Yeah. Wow. It's <laughs> I mean, think about the, 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 the Indiana Jones thing. So when people are talking, you know, it's exciting to, to think about where they might be in this chart. You know, because they're building this, this, you know, beliefs and, and I don't know how many times I said, how the hell did you come to that? I don't ask them that question. It's not a good meta model question. <laughs> but I go like, how the heck did you come up with that? You know, because it, in your mind, because you didn't go those stairs, you know, you didn't make those connections. You didn't have those experiences. But this gives you so much more information in that respect. It's getting dark in here because it's about to rain. <laughs> I'm going to see if like, the contractors just left. So I'm going to see if I can open the door and turn the whole light on. Hold on one second. <laughs> this, this, this masterclass, I, I have understood the same things over and over, but every single time is a little bit different. And uh, it's amazing all the uses that we can 
yeah. have with this. And this model is very interestingly worked on during the master practitioners. So it's a very good opportunity to, to practice that and to do or redo a master prac, which is very, very much uh, interesting about using this, uh, this model. Even the practitioner, yeah. you know, like I said, I, it, to me, that's the gem. But, and it's not just, the real key is to write this out, practice this. I mean, certainly if, when you're seeing clients, put this model on, <laughs> turn it on, turn it on your filter, and start jotting down where you notice them. And you're gonna gain more and more information from it. And it gives you a map to follow and it helps you understand, you know, where they built these things from and where to put the change in that you can have that impact for them. Yeah. Kathleen, thank you very much. I think, yeah, we made two hours. Yeah. <laughs> we did it. Any questions from YouTube or they all just, there's <laughs> many amazed people that okay. are, are commenting. Oh, happy. Yes, that's we cool. have to practice. That's and, my goal. Uh, are they happy? That's that's my value right there. <laughs> yes. uh, it's hard not seeing everybody. <laughs> yeah. I miss live trainings. I want to see people react. I want to see people go. <gasps> yes. No. We have we have Jane that's, that's saying thank you so much and uh, Maha. Kala. Kala. <laughs> when is the next master class? <laughs> John Johnson also is having a question. Where, where is the world just located in your plan? Uh, On this plan. Yeah, I talked about that yesterday a little bit. When uh, one of the exercises we did yesterday was I had somebody meta model the question. So as a client, I say, what do you want? And I wanted the client to say, it's just not possible. Now, where's the meta model pattern in there? It, it's all over the planet. There really is no clear, distinct, you know, some people would say, oh, it's a modal operator possibility, but like, not really, <laughs> just because they said it's not possible. Um, it's, and it's just, because when people use the word just, there's two things that happen. One is you know that they're raising to a level of belief because they justify what's going on. It's a justification. So they say, it's just this. They also minimize. It's just that I can't go to the party. You know, you didn't say I can't go to the party. You go, it's just that I can't go to the party. It's, it's just that I don't want to. It, yeah. It's just that I don't feel well. So they're justifying something that they're saying. So when somebody uses the word just, I think that raises to the level of belief because there's a belief, or at least they want you to have the belief <laughs> that, that it's not possible or that they, you know, they, they really want to, but they can't, or they really uh, want to, but they don't want to, but they don't want you to know they don't want to. So, so I think, you know, there's a strategy engaged in there. It's a very low belief but it's also using some sort of strategy rather than just telling you flat out, I don't want to go to your party. Um, you're going to try and, and it's just that, you know, I have too many things to do this week. Or So you're, you're building this belief in you and them, um, but it's really a strategy for avoiding, you know, the conflict of the situation. Yes. So it's definitely, you know, I think it's, so it's definitely in my mind anyway. Um, yeah it's definitely somewhere in here. But as soon as you hear the word just, um, it's just that I can't, it's just that I whatever, um, they're working in the land of beliefs. Mm -hmm. And there's some sort of justification process going on. <laughs> yeah. Their strategy to justify what they're gonna say or do. Uh -huh. That's very interesting. I, I didn't think about that word. It's yeah, very it's interesting. A very powerful word. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so perhaps just to finish, uh, uh, would you would you mind stopping the sharing like that? We uh, yeah, yeah. will be all seen uh, <laughs> on the big screen. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah.
I'm back. <laughs> thank you. So really, Kathleen, we wanted to thank you. We want to thank you for uh, for your time, for uh, for this opportunity we have to to have this masterclass with you. Um, we want, we want to thank also everybody who is attending and all those who are going to be attending in the next few days and months and years, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. We're finally back to live trainings again. And starting in August, we're very excited. Yeah. We get to see people again and not in little tiny boxes. <laughs> yes. It's it's amazing. We we have been saying that uh, this this Zoom thing is opening opportunities to do these kind of things and I, I i don't think we are going to 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 go back in that level but uh, we just finished our uh, a practitioner in, in live and to do exercises with live people that you can see the reaction of all yeah. of them and uh, the, the oh, pattern that great. everything is different Uh, you are frozen. Kathleen is frozen. <laughs> anyway, I, I think the, the, the main point is practice, really, yeah. really practice. And I have been hearing all uh, Richard and back? John, you're back. Yes, okay. <laughs> I was saying that the, the point is to practice and I have been hearing uh, Richard and John and you every single time telling us practice 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 and it is and uh, it's I think it's the way to to get better at this yeah. absolutely a absolutely and like I was saying when I froze I don't I don't plan on stopping doing master classes and things like this I think it's one thing that this whole mess has uh, taught us the value of being able to reach people, you know, all over the world and, and get everybody together to talk about something or do a masterclass. I think they're great. And it's, you know, you don't want to travel halfway across the world to do a one day seminar or a two hour seminar. So for smaller things, I think this is, is great that I've learned how to use Zoom. <laughs> and, uh, and I think we can, you know, do more things like this is, is great in between the seminars. I love it. So yeah, and Kathleen, I, I cannot thank you enough. You for me, you are a mentor. You're the the, the jewel <laughs> of the of the crown. <laughs> no, I really mean it. I really I, I I really enjoy learning from you because when I learned the meta model the first time, it wasn't with um, with you guys and it, they told me you have to learn this by heart and. Don't matter if you don't understand. Just be able to bark it. Yes. No, it's it's so much fun the way that uh, it is taught yeah. by you and in the with with uh, Richard. Thank you. It's amazing. Thank you. And and I, I, th I thank both of you. I think you you guys have done a great job with um, all the things you've done. We've done master classes with Richard and. With John and um, and bringing me out now, it's I think it's it's great to be able to provide this for the people all around the world that haven't had the opportunity to train with us yet or to see this particular model or something that Richard or John have done. So thank you guys, for, you guys are fabulous. I miss you. Yeah, <laughs> I miss you too. I miss you too. <laughs> So thank you very much, and thank you to also to all the uh, everyone who participated, everyone who was watching us, and remember just subscribe. We have a lot of content also to give on the channel with uh, master classes, with many other interesting things. So just subscribe, and we really hope to see all of you very soon in person. <laughs> And Kathleen, we wish you all the best. Thank, Thank you, you so much. It was great mm -hmm. being here. Thank you bye very bye. much. You're the best. <laughs> bye bye.